What we are going to assure tonight is that you have authority. Say, I have authority. Given me by Jesus. And there is no demon who can defeat me. Because I have the power of God to resist the devil. And I will do it. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. Glory to God in Jesus' name. The first gate that we have down here is called unbelief. It's an awful gate. Unbelief. A gate of unbelief. There are millions of people who don't believe today, and the devil's to blame for it. He's a liar. They don't believe in healing. They're, some of them don't even believe in water baptism. They're afraid of water. So, some, of them, some of them say the word of God is not true. That's another lie. Yeah. Unbelief. I'd like to tell you that yeah, it is a gate, all right, but it's a spirit, too. There are people that can see mighty miracles take place right down there. Walk out of the city and say, I didn't see anything. So a wonder you even find your car. You're so stupid. <laughs> Here the power of God is evident and the anointing of God is evident, but a spirit of unbelief says, it's not true. Not true. Without faith, you can't please God. He cannot be pleased without faith. If you don't have faith, you have no way of pleasing God. So we have to believe something to please God. The great men of the whole of the Bible were people that believed something. And how glad we are that you and I tonight can, can come into a place of saying, Lord, I believe. I believe. Faith is the greatest power that a man or a woman can ever have upon the face of this earth. It can move mountains for you. It can bring into being that which is not in being. It can do that which no other strength can do. It's a mighty force. And we must believe. But the devil has his gate. And that gate says, can't be done. Won't ever be done. And I want to talk to you and tell you something. You're a liar. It can be done. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory be to God. Well, hallelujah! Thank God we believe. Say, I believe! Oh, blessed be his wonderful name. It's a gate that the devil don't want the people inside his domain to ever discover and get out of. He may have sugar pie and raspberry dumplings written on the other side, but he's a liar. It's a gate they can't get out of. But I want to tell you now, you can knock down his gates. You have authority to knock down his gates. He can't keep you from knocking down his gates. He that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. We can build faith upon faith. I believe that faith is a growing thing in our lives. I think Moses was attaining to higher faith until the day that he laid his hands upon Joshua and the spirit of wisdom came into that young man. There's one thing that saddens me. The Bible says the path of the just grows brighter and brighter. It's to see men of God in a recession. They don't have as much as they had 
last year or the year before. And they haven't grown any, you see. It, it, there has to be a reason for it. Right now, I'm preaching to more people than I ever preached to in my life. With our 12 TV stations in this country, and my son Peter, who's with us here tonight with his family, he's ready for some more. Yeah. He just wants to talk to more people about Jesus. And the Lord told me in the Philippines, a time will come when the, when the great commercial entities, networks, will not permit the name of God on their station. Yeah. In South Bend, Indiana, I was put off of the AB station, the ABC station, put off. You say, why were you put off? That's, that was before I had a station there. You say, why were you put off? In my, in my church, there was a, a lovely Christian family that had a little girl born, and one foot went that way, and one foot went this way. It was the saddest looking thing you've ever seen. It had one total foot going backwards, and one going forwards. He couldn't walk. Ever did that? And they brought the baby to me, and I looked up and I said, do you people believe that God can do this? They said, yeah, yeah, we, we believe. Laid my hands on that child, and that foot said, burp, burp. and they were, both, they were both out in front. And, 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 and I, took the little girl over there with the mother and the father to the ABC station. And we stood the little girl up and had a picture with us with one of her feet going backwards and, and uh, one going forwards. And then we showed her. Everybody liked it except the manager. When I walked out of that studio, there I met him as if he'd been baptized in ketchup. <laughs> he was angry. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, get off my station. He says, I am canceling your ever being on here again. Well, I said, what in the world did I do? He said, you showed that little girl with a foot and you said that, 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 that through prayer it turned around. Says doctors have to do that. Well, I said, Dr. Jesus did do it. <laughs> and he got more angry. He said, you can never be on this station again. And then I prophesied. <laughs> I said, sir, in this city, I'll have a television station better than yours, stronger than yours, and I'm going to preach miracles on it, and you can't do anything about it either. He laughed like a horse, ha ha. He said, you see that camera? It cost $150,000. I said, sir, the devil don't have anything. God can't have one better. I'll have one better now. <laughs> so we have our own station. And some real embarrassing things take place. Peter can tell you, my son here, he's our general manager of all of our stations. Uh, they were about to have a Notre Dame a football game at night. It may have been the only one they've ever had because they don't have lights for, for night football. But they decided to put on a night game up there a couple of years ago. And if something didn't break down just when they wanted to start the game, they called up NBC station. They said, we don't have one, but I tell you, uh, if you... If you 
called Channel 46 out there, that religious station, we think they may have one. <laughs> the company didn't believe it, so they went to the ABC. My friends, you know. <laughs> and they said, uh, we, we, we need this piece of equipment here. We'll pay you well for the use of it for one night, but we cannot get the lights on without it. We've got to have it. I said, sorry, we don't have one. But says, you know, I imagine that religious station has one. <laughs> it was the same guy that put me off the air. And they went to the third one. There are only the three networks in town, and we are the independent. And so finally they had to hang dog tail and come out to see us. So, Peter, how much did you charge him for using it? That was nice, wasn't it? How big was their piece of equipment? About this big. We only charged them $2,000 for using it two hours, and then we brought it back home. If you're not careful, you know, if the devil mistreats you, you can laugh at him. Hallelujah! The gates of hell. The first thing I ought to tell you is this. We are in a warfare. The apostle at the termination of his life said, I have fought a good fight. I just want to tell you something. You can't fight a good fight in a rocking chair. Get out! Dance a little bit. Hallelujah! Get out in the street where the people are. We just came back from Russia a week ago. There's a move of God in Russia. Who, brother, you couldn't imagine it. There's a move of God in that country. We had our boat. God told us to do it. Anchored in Russia when Gorbachev was under house arrest. And when he came out and dissolved the Soviet Union and started the Soviet Republic, the Russian Republic, there was chaos in the land. No longer would communism give you a food stamp. The people were hungry. They had had a change of government so dramatic they didn't know how to handle it. <laughs> And here come our pastors with about 10 million pounds of food. Did you know they still talk about it all over Russia? We brought in thousands of pounds of, uh, of, of, of grain uh, seed. They're still growing corn in Russia from our seed, you see. Yeah. How glad we are. God, in a mysterious way, can put you at the right place at the right time. And many people in Russia, pastors have told me, says what kicked this whole thing off was when it got all over the nation that you had given these people 10 million pounds of food free, and that the pastors of the churches were handing it out to the people free. They said, we'd like to serve that Jesus. We had a great time over there. And uh, so many were saved. So many were blessed. It just thrilled our hearts as to what God is doing today. Yeah, we walked through the red square and said, you ain't red no more. You're still dirty, but you're not red anymore. The seed of atheism had been knocked to pieces. That's right. They who had contaminated almost the whole earth with atheism are now begging for Bibles. When our ship was being unloaded there, I noticed six men standing down at the bottom. And they were 
you know, uh, Secret Service men stand a little different than others, you know. They got the hand on the trigger, if you don't know what they've got. And they stood there. And they changed men and came back. So I got kind of tired of it. I went down and I said, well, what do you fellas think you're doing here? I said, I just want to tell you something. If somebody starts up this plank to get on that boat and steal some food, he won't ever live to the top. I'll shoot him. They stayed there for several days, and finally, I said to them, I said, gentlemen, what is it you want? You want some food to take home? They, you know, those kind of men that have been trainers, you know, steely-faced, they don't look at anybody, you know. They didn't say anything. I said, just tell me what you want. One of them leaned over, he said, "Uh, you got any Bibles? (laughs) <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Old Stalin would turn over in hell <laughs> if he knew his secret police were now begging for Bibles. Don't you ever think God's not a winner? He's a winner. You stick in there and you'll win. The only ones that lose are those that quit. And if you'll keep moving, you'll win. God will make you win. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Some people quit just before the total victory. That's no time to quit, honey. Jesus made us winners. The next one that we see down here, how many glad that rascal's gone, you know? Old unbelief is out of here now. Next door lives the gate of apostasy. Apostasy means that you have deserted and left behind the truth, and you have given heed to untruth. And maybe you are even teaching untruth. Or maybe you have backslidden and you're going against everything you used to teach. Backslidden preachers. Let's see. Apostasy. There is a gate for hell that we call apostasy. It's a strong gate. The devil made it strong. But I just want to tell you something right now. Apostasy cannot stand before what you saw here tonight. Are you here? Apostasy can't stand before the shout of triumph. Hallelujah! So what we have to do in the world that we live is to be red-hot Christians and burn up all apostasy. (laughs) <laughs> the gate of apostasy. He, th- he thinks he's strong. You know what he's saying right now? He's saying, remember, you're 83. You might hurt yourself. <laughs> well, I'll just show you something here real fast. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah! We are the fruit of the living fires of Pentecost that came down 2,000 years ago. We have the evidence of it today, and apostasy has to go. It has to go. I believe every word in the Bible, and I'm going to live right. Live right. You can all go to hell. I'm going to heaven. Not imitating anybody else. Just sticking with the book and going to heaven in Jesus' name. I fear that we, I mean, uh, 
a gate that we really should talk about for quite a while. We'll talk about it a little bit about philosophy first, the gate of philosophy. Man is full of vain imaginations. And if they didn't rewrite their books on philosophy and science about every three years, everybody would know they're crazy <laughs> because they have to go against everything they've said. You know. People that call themselves philosophers cannot tell you why. You know they're a whoremonger, a thief, a liar, and you stood up as clean as an angel. <laughs> Their philosophy don't teach that, honey. No, God's philosophy does. The vain imaginations of the human mind. This is right and that's right. It's not right if it's not in the Word of God. God's Word is correct. Say correct. correct. And it is right. We believe it. <laughs> well, hallelujah. We believe it. The philosophies of men, the teachings of men. You can go clear back to the Greek philosophers, you know. You can read it all you want to. It's never got anybody to heaven yet. And it hadn't put together a broken home yet. All it can do is deal with a perverted mind that's away from God and make you think you know something that somebody else don't know. I've heard that about 90% of all you learn in getting your PhD, you never use. You never use it. Only 10% of it you use it in your everyday life. But I want you to know one thing. All I get... <laughs> in this big book here, I use it all. <laughs> Woo! I use it all. I don't eliminate 90% of it. Man's philosophy with a perverted mind will not take you to the pearly gates of the new Jerusalem. But I want you to know something. If you will know Jesus as a personal Savior with a clean life, you'll make it to the pearly gates. How many say, I believe. I believe. I believe. That means we don't go along with this thing called, called man's philosophical thinking with his brain and his mind. All the philosophy in the world today don't know how to hold the family together. They don't know how to get people to stop shooting one another. They don't have any answers. But Jesus has answers to every one of them. Christ is the answer. And Christ has the answer. So we say to human philosophy, get out of the way of the church. We got a marching church. And in these last days, it's going to march harder and faster than ever before. And that we are ready to say to the gates of hell, be gone. We say, go! Go! Hallelujah! Go! You see, that seems pretty easy. Yeah, that's the way with Christianity. We got more power than anyone else. We got more authority than anyone else. And so it is easy. It's not hard to live for God. And it's not hard to resist the devil. And it's not hard to knock down his gate. You just... Say, get down! And they have to go down. But you gotta say something. <laughs> you gotta say something. And when you say go, they have to go. Millions of people in this country and the world suffer from what we call fear. Fear is an awful monster. I could tell you stories for the next hour about fear. Unbelievable. I have a very close friend in Hong Kong, Chinese man. He is a very wealthy man. That man has not been out of his bedroom 
in over 25 years. He's scared to. He said, what are you scared of? He won't let but a couple of people go in besides the family. He'll let me go in if I'm in town, but he would not let others go in. He's afraid to. I've told him, I said, let me cast that thing out. Oh, he says, it cannot be cast out. I can tell you story after story of intelligent people, not stupid people, intelligent people bound by this thing called fear. It's one of the devil's strongest gates because you can't win great victories with fear. You lose every time, you see. Fear's a monster to destroy. And, and you have to get rid of fear. Oftentimes, fear begins in the home with parents. Don't go in there. There's a booger man in there. Well, you know you're lying. There's nothing in that room. You just don't want the kid to go in there. You see. And we teach our kids about it. Then a boy walked in the house and he said, you know, Mama, there's a lion in the front yard. The mother says, no, there's not a lion. Well, yes, there is. I saw it. He said, now, you know, there's no lion in the front yard. No, I saw it. He said, there's a lion there. He says, why don't you just go in your bedroom there and talk to Jesus about this and come back. So he went in the bedroom, stayed a few minutes, and came back and said, what did Jesus say? Well, I had a talk with Jesus, and he said he thought it was a lion the first time he saw it. <laughs> the unreasonable powers of fear, unreasoning fear. God wants to rid our, you know, we miss great things in life because we're afraid to accept the challenge. We're, we're afraid to step out in God a little further than we've been before. And because of that, we're so afraid we'll lose what we got, we want to keep that little bit, and we never plant it in order to have more, you see. Fear is an awful monster. Fear does all kinds of strange things, causing us not to be the person that God wants us to be, causing us to stop when we ought to be marching forward. Fear is an awful mess. We've lived around fear. On the mission field, the poor people are bound by fear, all kinds of fear. Every Muslim is afraid, you know. The little genie might get them, torment them or something. But what has ever seen one but they believe they're there? Yeah. And, and that thing just holds on to them, generation after generation. And there may be some of you that have fear that you picked up from your parents. and They may have picked it up from their parents. That would mean your grandparents. I just want to tell you something. Just because somebody else has it, you don't have to have it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're not your parents. And whatever, whatever mistakes they may have made, whatever problems they may have had, you don't have to have them. Oh, don't you think I, I have some genes that go back go on. Oh, Jeannie, you don't need that junk. You are a free-born human person, and you can make a decision with Jesus, and it stands. Hallelujah! It stands! Don't matter what your mama, what your daddy, what your grandpa says, it stands. You're not bound by traditions of men. Okay? The gate of fear the devil uses that gate to torment so many people. But I just want to tell you something. You can help us to bring out the slaves of the devil if you can just get rid of that, rid of that, spirit, that spirit of fear. God wants that thing defeated. God wants you to be victorious. God wants you to rise up above that thing. And he's now ready this night to take fear out of your life. When I was 17 years old, God gave me Isaiah 41 and 10. The first words are, fear thou not. God took fear out of my life. Honey, that's 65 years ago. 
and it hadn't been back yet. I don't know where it went. But here's something sweet. If you have been set free from something, you can set other people free from what you got free from. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah! If you've had tuberculosis, you can set people free from tuberculosis. You should say, Juan, well, you overcame it. You're sitting on top of it. You can stomp it to pieces. Others may not, but you can. Whatever you have alcohol, whatever you've been delivered from, you can set others free from that. <laughs> and becoming free, you also become the power to, to stop it, to quit it, to let it go down. Fear is a monster for churches, for people, for families. It's an awful thing. Fear is. We have a whole book about fear. It's a terrible thing to mess up your life. I look back and if I had been afraid, I would have missed the great things of life. I went out to preach three weeks after being healed of tuberculosis with just 65 cents. And I wasn't afraid. Although my father told me I would have starved to death, I didn't believe it. So I went out to preach for 65 cents. Got on a boat in San Francisco to be a missionary with $12 and no denomination and no church promising. One a cent. Now, it would have been easy to stay off of that boat. I had an Assembly of God pastor there ready to help me stay off of it. I think he might have bought my ticket home if I'd have taken it, you know. But he told me, he said, you know, you're going to go to China and starve to death. Now, I'm an Irishman besides being a Christian. And the Irish always laugh at the wrong time. They don't know when to laugh. And so when he said I was going to go and starve to death in China, I, I got so tickled I didn't know what to do. I said, Dr. Craig, if you would just send a little stone out there about this big and say, here lies rest of somehow, starve to death trusting Jesus. I'd appreciate it. He says, no, I won't do it. Well, I says, I appreciate that too because I won't need it. Goodbye now. didn't have enough money to stay in a decent hotel overnight and have breakfast. But for three years that tour went forward around the planet Earth and locally through local people. I feel sorry really for missionaries who keep feeling they got to get their money from this country. Honey, I can live in the Philippines and drive a golden Cadillac. 24 carat if you don't mind. You say, why? Well, the money's there. Why let the devil have it? Some of the most beautiful homes in the world's there. Why don't you go live in one of them? Ah, oh, I can't afford it. Well, go on home. You no business over there anyway. In every country in the world, I have a friend from Nigeria. I think he's supposed to come here. He, he told me, he says, is, is Baccarat here yet? Huh? Amen. Back where I said, if any Nigerian preacher ever writes for money, send a letter to me. I'd like to dress him down for you. You say, why? Well, he owns about three Mercedes Benz. He owns a 707 airplane, four engines, and running great. And uh, walks around like a very wealthy man. When I went to preach for him, he handed me. 2,000 American dollars and said, this is a little spending money. We're going to take up your love offering later. <laughs> this is an Africa I'm talking about. I want to tell you something. If you start raising the dead and healing the sick, you'll do well everywhere. Yeah. yeah. 